Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to our last lecture in the series this spring. And our speaker this evening is Ann Mulligan. And Ann is an assistant scientist in the Marine Policy Center here at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Uh, but our academic background is in geology. And I think you'll find uh, Ann's talk this evening very interesting as she begins to skirt the policy and science issues and try to blend uh, good policy development from a good science background. Um, it started out as a basic geology project, but she soon found many interesting applications of her work related to contaminant plumes on Cape Cod. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ann Mulligan, and the title of her talk is Glacial History and Contaminant Transport on Cape Cod. Thanks, Judy. I'd like to start out by encouraging you all to ask questions when you have them, and particularly, particularly if I use a phrase, <coughs> excuse me, or terminology that you're not familiar with. I would much rather have you follow along with the talk than wait until the end. If at some point there gets to be too many questions, then I might ask you to hold off. But for now, let's go ahead and uh, ask questions when you have them. Okay, before I get started, I would like to acknowledge several people. Uh, first of all, this project started with, together with Al Yachupi. Some, several of you probably know him. Some of you may recognize him from walking around town. He's been at Huey for quite a while, and he's actually retired from the geology and geophysics department. But fortunately, fortunately for me, he continues to come into work every day. So he and I have struck it up s several conversations and eventually started this project together about a year ago. I wasn't able to find a picture of Jack Cook, but he's put in a lot of time in developing the three-dimensional animation that I'll show towards the end of the talk. And finally, there have been several uh, groups at Huey that have provided funding for various stages of this project. <clears throat> now, when Al and I were looking at the glacial history of Cape Cod, we were interested in large-scale processes. So we were looking at the sediment distribution across the upper and mid cape and along the lower cape. Now we noticed several smaller scale features. Uh, in particular, there's one in the western and northwestern portion of the cape that we'll see is relevant to groundwater flow and transport in that area of the cape. Many of you, are if not all of you, are probably aware of the groundwater contamination emanating from the Massachusetts Military Reservation, which I'll refer to as MMR. Military Reservation is in the northwest, northwestern corner of the Cape. For reference, we have Route 151 running just south of the base. Route 28 runs along the western side of the base. Uh, we have the town of Bourne up here. Uh, there's the Schumann Pond and John's Pond, Mashpee Wakeby Pond. This map is from the, mess the MMR website. It's from October 2001. So it's a fairly recent depiction of the known plumes at MMR. The yellow and red shapes all reflect groundwater contamination plumes. The color just is, refers to different contaminants. But there are approximately 13 known plumes at the base. Now, I'll get back to the, to the contaminant plumes towards the end of the talk, but first I want to go over a few general concepts in, in groundwater hydrology and then in glaciology, and then we'll go start looking at the glacial history, the sediment distribution, what that implies about the history, and then we'll come back to the plumes towards the end. First off, let's look at a couple of things in groundwater hydrology. Now, when rain falls on the land, there are a couple things that can happen to it. The rain, the water can directly evaporate. It might accumulate at the surface, run, run over the ground surface, and, and collect in streams and rivers, and ultimately discharge in the ocean. Or it might infiltrate into the ground. Now, immediately below the ground surface, we have soil. And in between the soil grains, there's both air and water. We call this the unsaturated zone. In this zone, water flow is primarily vertical. Down at some level, enough water is accumulated so that all of the pore space between the, between the soil grains is filled with water. 
This is a saturated zone. This is where groundwater can now flow horizontally and vertically. The, the top elevation of the saturated zone is called the water table. Below the area of recharge, the water table tends to mound up and, and water then flows from the area of a high water table to the area of a lower water table. Now in this depiction, we have these arrows showing groundwater flow that are fairly well distributed. And this implies that the flow itself is well distributed, which would occur if the sediments are all of pretty much the same type. So if it's a medium sand, for example, we would expect flow to be well distributed through the sand. Conversely, if we had sediments of, di of a different nature adjacent to each other, then we would expect groundwater flow to really be affected by those different sediments, particularly if they're drastically different. For example, if we have a clay next to a sand and gravel, we would expect water to be primarily flowing in the sand and gravel. It has much larger pore spaces, they're much better connected, and water can flow much easier through that kind of soil. So I'll go ahead and pass these around if you want some examples. So in a general sense, if we're just thinking about groundwater uh, from a conceptual standpoint, we can think of it this way. However, when we look at particular groundwater issues in, sp in specific areas, it's very important to understand the distribution of the different sediment types because they will have a very, or they can have a profound impact on where groundwater is flowing and how it's flowing. Now in Cape Cod, the sediments are all here from, from glacial processes. Approximately 21 to 24,000 years ago, we were in the middle of an ice age. The, the, uh, con the Laurentide Continental Ice Sheet extended across much of North America. It extended down into the Midwest and covered New York and New England. This is the uh, ice sheet at, at its maximum. And so it brought a lot of, the ice sheet brought a lot of debris and sediment from the north. It eroded it out, brought it down to the south, and deposited a lot of it. And that's, that's the nature of Cape Cod. I'd like to talk a little bit about some important depositional environments that are re related to Cape Cod history. Here is just a look at a glacier, looking up a glacier. It's bound on, both si on two sides by mountains. We see a lot of dark material on top of the ice. That's sedimentary debris. It can range in size from clays all the way up to cobbles and boulders. Here's the front margin of the glacier. We can see off to the right here, there's a meltwater stream. So the ice from the glacier is melting and flowing out and down into this glacial lake, into this lake in front of the glacier. As the meltwater flows, it, it transports sediment from the glacier and it sequentially deposits the, the coarse sediment near the glacier and sequentially is finer and finer sediment as we move away. When the water flows into the lake, the water slows, the velocity slows down considerably and the very fine particles, the very fine sand, silts, and clays can then settle out of suspension and are deposited at the bottom of the lake. So at the meltwater stream, we would expect to see sands and gravels. In the lake, we would expect to see silts, clays, and very fine sands. Now in some settings, we can get a very large network of these meltwater streams, and they can deposit, it, deposit what are called outwash plains. So here we have a network of braided streams at different times during the day, different seasons, different years, the volume of water coming off the glacier will change. And as the volume of water changes, these streams move across this outwash plain and deposit sands and gravels in a nice broad plain. Much of Cape Cod is an outwash plain, or it's a series of outwash plains. And finally, the last feature I want to point out is called an end moraine. End moraines are sedimentary deposits at the margin of the ice. 
And there are two models for how these moraines get developed. And the bottom model is called the conveyor belt. And in this case, the glacier is acting like a conveyor belt. It advances over the, the surface of the earth. It erodes a lot of soil and rock, picks up the debris. And then when the ice melts at the, margin, the front margin of the glacier, all of that sediment just gets dropped, and it forms a ridge of unsorted material. The second model, and the one that's relevant to Cape Cod, is shown on the top. It's called the glaciotectonic model. And in this model, the glacier acts like a bulldozer. And what happens here is the sediment in front of the glacier just gets bulldozed as the glacier advances. Faults form, and sheets of the sediment just get piled one on top of each other. And this is the type of moraine we have on Cape Cod. Now there's been a lot of work mapping the surface, surface geology of, Cape, of the Cape and Islands. A lot of it has been done by Bob Oldale, who is at the USGS here in Woods Hole, among others. Now in, in, all of his map, in all of their mapping, they've determined that three, primate, three ice lobes extended down to the Cape and Islands. The Buzzards Bay lobe came in from the, from the west, the northwest. The Cape Cod Bay lobe came down from the north and the South Channel Lobe came in from the east. They extended approximately to the latitude of the islands, deposited a bunch of debris that ultimately formed the islands, and then retreated up to Cape Cod where they subsequently deposited more debris. The story can be, is revealed by, again, the surface geology. This map is, is also taken by Bob, from Bob Oldale's book. I have added the ice contact deposits. That's, that's my addition because they are important later to this story. Um, but we can see there are moraines on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. This reflects where the ice was approximately 21,000 years ago. Outwash deposits are shown in blue and green. The blue outwash deposits, outwash plains, are younger than the moraines, so they were there first. The green Outwash plains are older than the moraines, so they were after the, they came about after the moraines were formed. What's an ice contact deposit? I'll tell you in just a sec as I get up to there. Good question. Okay, so we we see that the, the ice slopes came down to the islands, formed the islands, and then retreated, and the the ice slope temporarily stopped along the south shore of Cape Cod. Now, ice lobe deposits are, are sediments from the glacier that are deposited at the ice margin, but rather than being directly from the ice, they're actually from the meltwater, so that there's a little bit of sorting that goes on. So it's just a different, it's, it's secondary to the, it's a secondary process to the ice rather than directly from the ice. Today, we, we see there, there's an isolated, a set of six isolated hills that are identified as ice contact deposits. So the ice was temporarily along the, the south shore. These deposits were formed. Then the ice retreated, probably to about the north shore of the Cape, at which point these outwash plains shown in blue were deposited. At some point after that, the Buzzards Bay lobe advanced to create the Buzzards Bay Moraine, which extends all the way out to the Elizabeth Islands, and then retreated. And then a little bit later, the Cape Cod Lobe advanced to create the Sandwich Moraine, and then retreated. Just so you, you all know, or have some frame of reference, Route 6 runs along the Sandwich Moraine. So you're fairly high when you're driving up there. Um, parts of 28 run along the Buzzards Bay Moraine, but a lot of it is on the base. Okay, so after the Sandwich Moraine was formed, the ice retreated, and then additional outwash plains were deposited. This is the history just based on the surficial geology. In 1961, a 1,000-foot deep borehole was drilled in Harwich. And when they drilled this, they found a approximately 45 to 50 meters of silts below the outwash sands and gravels. 
Ever since then, there's been, this, there's been speculation that a large glacial lake once covered like probably Nantucket Sound and Cape Cod. But not a lot of work has actually been done in, try, in trying to define that lake and what its history was or confirm whether it actually existed or not. So that's what Al and I said about doing. In order to do that, we collected about 290 boring logs from across Cape Cod. We did not do the, bore, we did not do the drilling ourselves. These are not our logs. Excuse me, they're from a, a, a bunch of different sources. A lot of them are from drillers who were installing private water wells. Some are from environmental reports. Others are from town wells. And some are from the US Geological Survey themselves. Fortunately for me, the USGS had already collected a lot of boring logs across the Cape, so I could just go into their files and search through there. All, the ones, all of these points in green identify locations of boring logs from the USGS files. The green squares are, are drill holes, well logs that went down to bedrock. So we have a full accounting of the unconsolidated material. The green circles do not go to bedrock. Some of them go down to and encounter fine material. Some of them do not. And then finally, we filled in the northwest corner and some of the western area with boring logs from environmental reports published about MMR. They've done a lot of drilling there in the past 10 to 15 years, and so there's a tremendous amount of information. We've only sampled a, a few of the boring logs available, but we were looking for large-scale processes, and so we were really looking for a good aerial distribution. Uh, on the order of 40 meters in the west and out upwards of 120 meters to the east in the Chatham area. So let me go back to this. Now, when we reviewed these logs, we were, looking, again, we were looking for evidence of a glacial lake. So primarily, we were looking for evidence of very fine sands, silts, and clays. If we found that, then we evaluated the description as, a potential, as potential evidence of glacial lake. In, there, is, there is the possibility that these fine grain materials are found in the outwash sands. So we, definitely, we looked at the material around, we looked at the thickness of the fine grain material and its relation to the sediments around it to try to decide whether it, it appeared to be an isolated lens in the outwash or was more likely glacial uh, lake deposits. And so we were primarily just distinguishing between those two types of sediments. So what, I'll do, what I'd like to show now are cross sections one, which extend from Falmouth to Chatham, and cross section two, which extends from Bourne down to Falmouth. And these are just vertical sections. You can cut down into the earth. Now here on the bottom, I show the horizontal scale. Over here is the vertical scale in its elevation in meters relative to sea level. There's a lot of vertical exaggeration here. Okay, these long black lines identify the boring, the boring locations. The top of the borings obviously are at land surface, and then the bottom, it just reflects how deep the borings went. So we see that there are five boring logs, borings that went down to bedrock, two in Falmouth, one in Yarmouth, one in Dennis, and one in Harwich. All five of them, 20 to 45 meters of silts or clays. In addition to those five, we find several other ones that don't go to bedrock, but still sample on the order of 10 to 15 meters of silt or clay. So we think that there's quite a bit of evidence that there's a lot of silt and clay at depth. This quite likely reflects that there was, in fact, a lake that once covered Cape Cod. Similarly, if we look... Do you, do you know the shape of the this, no, this was uh, taken from a seismic survey that Bob Oldale did quite a while ago, and it's published in the literature. 
it is, it's approximate, but he published a bedrock surface map. Yeah, I think that that this was, I don't remember if it extended into the sound. I know it, it had Cape Cod on it. It probably did extend into the sound. But that's, yeah, that's what this little business is about. Okay, if we look at the north-south section, north is to the right, south is to the left. We have a different horizontal and vertical scale here. Um, but we see the land surface, is much, and it slopes down to the south. Here we see evidence of much, much thicker outwash deposits, and yet we still have on the order of 10 to 20, upwards of 40 meters of silts and clays. So both in an east-west direction and in a north-south direction, there is evidence of, significant, of a significant deposit of silts and clays. In addition to the boring, to these cross sections, several boring logs describe depositional patterns characteristic of glacial lakes. And that is an alternating silt and clay sequence. And that reflects changes in the seasons. In the summer months, a lot, of, a lot more water comes into the lakes. The clays stay suspended, but the silts can settle out. In the winter months, it's much colder. Much less water comes into the lake. It's much more quiescent environment, and the clays settle out. And so there's a very characteristic alternating silt and clay pattern called VARS. And there are some, there aren't a lot of them, but there are some descriptions of this inner bedding in some of the boring logs. So, in looking at all those logs, we feel that there's significant evidence that a lake once covered Cape Cod. Some recent work, or work by a recent graduate student in Vineyard Sound, in which he did some vibracore sampling and some seismic reflection work, indicates that there are some fine-grained sediments in the sound, but they seem to be isolated to to small depressions or, isol or local depressions in the outwash surface, so they do not appear to be extensive across the sound. So we haven't seen evidence yet that would indicate that this lake extended into the sound. That's a good question. I don't exactly know what it would be would have been. I empty. think it was sorry. The sound was empty of seawater. Yes, yes, it was. I would guess a couple hundred feet below what it is now. Does anyone else know? Something yeah. Something over 100 meters. Excuse me? Something over 100 meters. Over 100 meters. meters. Okay. Well, the only yeah. that would have been out near the Continental Shelf. Far out, yep. The Continental Shelf would have been the shoreline near the Continental Shelf. Is that about right? Yeah. Great question, and that's, we're going to come to that. That's, that's, that's very important, and that's actually where the, the whole groundwater contaminant stuff comes in, too. Uh, okay, back to the lake. So we don't, see, we don't see evidence that, at least not yet, that the lake extended into the sound. So we think probably what happened is that these ice con contact deposits were actually continuous. So that when the, the ice lobe retreated from the southern shore, the meltwater was caught behind or dammed behind these ice contact deposits. Then the ice extended up probably to the north shore of the Cape. And the reason we think that is because there's one of the boring logs from the sandwich moraine describes that characteristic seasonal deposition pattern associated with glacial lakes, so that we know there are lake deposits in the moraine. In order for them to be in the moraine, they either had to be deposited at the location of the moraine or slightly north, and then got pushed up. Okay, getting to Betsy's question. 
Why is this surface not flat? Uh, as, you, as Betsy pointed out, it's not. There's evidence that there's been some erosion. Presumably there's been some erosion here at several locations along the section. In order to investigate that, we, we looked at the logs, determined the elevation of this contact for all the logs, and then contoured that on a map of Cape Cod. So this is a contour map of the surface of these sediments. Uh, elevations are in meters relative to sea level, so this is at s approximately at sea level, and the contour intervals are in 20 meters. So 20 meters below sea level, 40 meters below sea level. Again, we have the Buzzards Bay Moraine to the west, the Sandwich Moraine to the north. The sediment in those has been faulted and deformed, so we really don't know what the surface looks like in the moraines or beyond the moraines. But nonetheless, we see here an interesting pattern in the surface that looks very much like a drainage channel. So presumably, along with tributaries. So at some point, either when the lake drained, perhaps there was a catastrophic failure of this southern dam, and there was a very quick, violent discharge of water that dug this these channels in, into, the sub, into the surface of the lake sediments and eroded those sediments out, or perhaps when the meltwater streams off the when the after the lake died and the meltwater streams from the ice were flowing across the surface, they dug these channels. But the evidence indicates that there's a channel along the western part of the Cape, one in the in the uh, perhaps in the Wakoit Bay area, a couple of smaller ones in the Barnstable area. They don't show up very well. I used dashed lines, which don't show up, and they reflect a, a 10 meter interval. They're much shallower. And then again, there's some more deep ones in the Bass River area, and then farther to the east in Harwich. Are there any questions about this service? Yes. These channels? Yeah. Uh, no, good question though. Um, what happened is after the lake drained, then these, the uh, outwash plains were deposited over these sediments. So there's now, uh, excuse me? From the ice to the north, yes. We think, we think that this, the, the ice contact deposits were probably continuous. And if they were, then they would have provided a, southern, a dam to the south. Okay. Then at some point, the dam gave way. The leg drained. These, dra these channels were carved into the surface. The silts and clays were eroded out. Then the meltwater streams from the ice then deposited the outwash plains, covering all of the silts and clays from the lake. And that's what we see at the surface today are those outwash plains. So if we zoom in on this big paleo channel in the west, okay. Does do, do people see that? Can people see that as, as a drainage channel? Water's flowing from the north, where the, where the sediments are at the highest elevations, down to the south and discharging to the, along the south shore. OK. Now, we did notice, we were curious as to where this channel was relative to other features in western Cape Cod. And this is an outline of the Massachusetts Military Reservation. We can see that the channel actually runs along the eastern half of the base. So that certainly piqued their curiosity. Uh, and then so we decided to look at where the plumes were. And if we look at the plumes, this, is a 19, this map is based on 1996 data, so the plumes look a little, they 
The plume shapes have been refined since then. There's certainly several more of them that are known. But nonetheless, the Shumit Valley plume looks like it's traveling right down the axis of this channel. To a lesser extent, CS10 looks like it's probably being influenced by this channel. LF1 flows to the west. Uh, it doesn't seem to be influenced by this channel at all. And then FS12 up here in the northeast is probably too small of a scale to really make some conclusions about its, how it's behaving relative to the, uh, to the lake deposits. But let me emphasize that this is two dimensions. This, these plumes are three, they're, they're traveling in a three-dimensional system. And these outlines are simply the two-dimensional projection of these plumes. Remember, these payload channels are on the order of 40 to 20 meters below sea level. So it's very important to determine. So. You know, we actually, we haven't graphed that one up yet, but that would be my first suspicion. Um, another thing is, is um, there's not a whole lot of data in here, so there might be some smaller scale feature that we're not showing. Okay, so now I want to show the three-dimensional animation of three of those plumes. And this is Jack Cook's handiwork. Okay, we're going to start with the view of the surface of Cape Cod. The, the canal runs up here. We can see evidence of the Buzzards Bay Moraine here and the Sandwich Moraine running along the North Shore. What's holes down here? Okay, we'll fly in, look at it from the top, identify the towns. Now, I think Wareham is identified incorrectly, but the other four, other five, I think are correct. <laughs> oh. Okay, now we're going to bring in the, uh, this portion, we're going to show, this is the uh, portion of the lake sediment surface that we're going to look at in three dimensions. So to the west, again, we have the Buzzards Bay Moraine. We don't know what the surface looks looked like beyond that. To the north, we have the Sandwich Moraine. We don't know what the surface looked like beyond that. And I cut it off to the east. I only went as far east as I needed to to show these plumes. And we're going to rotate around. And we can see from below the axis of this channel slopes from the north to the south, reflecting where drainage, the drainage direction. OK, we'll rotate back around. And we'll make the ground surface disappear. And we'll start focusing now on the subsurface in this channel. So here again, we see the main channel running down here. We have some tributaries coming off of it. And we can see then we're left with several highs that reflect what the original surface probably looked like. OK, now we're going to look at, we're going to put in the Ashumit Valley plume. And we can see right off the bat, it does look like the plumes traveling around this high. But again, we haven't shown yet that it's at the right elevation. So we'll turn it around. And we can see that the plume, which, does, which starts at the water table, but is in a recharge area, and so there's some vertical gradients. The plume actually dips down and is, actually, and is at the elevation of this high. It's actually a little bit lower than this high. So it does look like in this view, that it's within that paleo channel. It's within the coarse infilling sediments. Is there a reason that it uh, hasn't gone deeper into the channel? Just deeper down into here? Yeah. Um, 
I don't know that. I don't know um, if there is a reason or not. Presumably there is. Um, we just haven't gotten to that stage of the project yet to analyze that. I would like to do some, um, some groundwater modeling, though, to find out whether this conceptual model of the subsurface is consistent with everything else we know about the hydrology and plume transport. Yeah, Betsy? These plumes, like what you landed in purple there, mm -hmm. That's right. Of some kind of I took these from maps that are published uh, published by, I should say, that are presented in environmental reports from MMR. And typically, the outline of the plumes are defined by the maximum contaminant levels. So it depends sure. on the contaminant of concern and what the regulatory limits are for that particular contaminant. So Yeah. So, um, so in fact, some, like the question that this gentleman just asked, some of the, some of the contaminant might be below that level now, but maybe it's, it hasn't gotten to a concentration that. that oh, I see what you're, you're saying. The, the so you're saying that some of the co contamination could be lower. It's just not at a high enough concentration that we're mapping it right. as a plume. I mean, if you wait long enough, you might find it deeper. Right. Although if that were happening. I think, if, or if, if that were true, I, I don't think I would expect the plume to actually get thinner. Down gradient. Oh, no, I wasn't necessarily so, expecting to get thinner. I'd expect it to expand. As exactly. Possible. So I'm not, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would expect it to expand, not, not to get, right. not, not to drop. Now, one thing is, you know, there's certainly some, some wiggle room in, in this plume shell that we're showing. I mean, I, I obtained the data from looking at cross sections and maps from these reports. So there's, there's, there's some, I mean, they're not really precise, but they're approximately right. And on the scale of this map, I would say they're, they're pretty, pretty accurate. That's right. So basically, the groundwater is following these channels. Yes, that's a good point. Okay. So the plume, these contaminants are dissolved in the groundwater and so are traveling with the groundwater. And so we can use these plumes as tracers of groundwater flow. So this is indicating what groundwater is doing. Now Definitely. All of, all of these valleys you've got, they all flow groundwater. Yes, they are. Uh, yeah, well, in this Coming from where something was dumped at some point in the past. Uh, yeah, well, to be fair, let's use the word released rather than dumped. Yes, in this plume, the source was probably up here towards at, at the leading edge or at the uh, up, upgrading edge of the plume. And so the plume is showing how groundwater at that particular point is moving through the system. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Well, the plumes are, these are uh, dissolved uh, chemicals, so they're not being filtered by the sand. They're not being filtered. No. Um, the sand, the, they're, the pore spaces between the sands are fairly large, so they might be sufficient to uh, filter out particles, but not dissolved chemicals. Now, a possibility in the silts and clays is that some of these compounds actually get absorbed by the silts and clays. And that actually serves to, it does retain the compound temporarily, but in the long run it ends up getting released and it makes it harder to clean up actually. <laughs>
Any other questions? Okay, let's look at a couple more plumes. Okay, we're just going to put on the CS10. I'm going to wait a second until we rotate around to look at these a little bit more. I just want to point out again the Shumit Valley plume. It's looking like it's flowing in between these highs right in that channel. Okay, let's rotate around. The CS10 plume here is coming, is flowing vertically downward and looks like it's flowing around. It's actually shown in two pieces here. Uh, and I think the reason why is because I probably interpolated the surface right here incorrectly. I probably have it too high. Actually, this, when Jack made this plume, it, it is one piece. It's just when he positioned it properly, part of it is hidden by the silts, silts and clays. So just real quickly, if we go back to this overhead, these red triangles are, indicate where we have data. And so this part of the plume is right in here. And we can see that this contour actually extends down, but there's not a whole lot of control in there. So I may have just interpolated that incorrectly. Similarly, we see the western side of CS10, this lobe down here, looks like it's coming into, into the silts and clays but there are only a couple of data points in there. So it's quite possible, quite likely, in fact, that there are some small-scale heterogeneities that I just haven't shown in this map. But isn't there a western lobe that you showed on here that you don't show here that could be following that, that balance? The western lobe's hidden, hidden by the uh, silts and sands. It's there, but you can't see it because it's, it's below the silts and sands. So there's probably some heterogeneity in there that I haven't, haven't shown. The, the uh, primary, kind of the fat part of the plume right in here looks like it's in the valley. But this western lobe doesn't, is not in the valley. See that? And then unfortunately, FS12 is a little too small to see on this scale. Um, but it does look like, at least vertically anyways, it is being held up by the silts and clay. So I wouldn't expect it to travel vertically any farther than it already has. Um, groundwater in this area tends, uh, in the area of FS12, I believe, is traveling off kind of to the right. So it actually may, in this case, the plume may end up traveling up this tributary because that's where the groundwater flow is occurring, which is a little counterintuitive. Okay, so we're just going to zoom in. CS10 actually is discharging into John's Pond, so I'm showing it here for reference. You can locate yourself horizontally, and we're going to zoom out. And bring the ground surface back in, and there's John's pond. Okay, so just to summarize and conclude, we looked at on the order of 290 boring logs across the Cape. That does include the lower Cape, uh, and the, and there is significant evidence in terms of the sedimentary pattern and the sedimentary. Uh, deposits themselves, the fine grain deposits, that glacial lakes once covered Cape Cod. Lake Wampanoag, which is what we call the lake on, on the upper and mid Cape, eventually drained. It looks like large and deep paleo channels eroded out a lot of the sediment, which was these paleo channels were subsequently infilled with coarse grain sands and gravels from the outwash plains. The, uh, the plumes, at least certainly the Shumit Valley plume from MMR, provides a nice tracer of groundwater flow and is clearly within the confines of the Paleo Channel, at least the southern half of that plume is. And so we think there's significant evidence that, these, that the lakes existed and then that these Paleo Channels are there. And if that's true, then there are certainly some implications for 
trying to predict where these contaminants are going to go in the future. We would expect them to stay within these paleo channels if they stay at depth. Now, and again, these systems are, the groundwater flow system is three-dimensional. So the groundwater flow will be affected by recharge by the surface water bodies, including the coastal ocean. And so it's not just an issue of sediment. It's also, it's an issue of the entire hydrologic system. But nonetheless, uh, these sediments do appear to be exerting a significant control on groundwater flow in the subsurface. And that has some implications for, again, for predicting contaminant transport, which is important for risk assessment, determining whether these contaminants pose a human or ecological health risk. For remediation design, we certainly need to understand how groundwater is flowing in the subsurface to efficiently remove these contaminants. And from a water supply perspective, both from quantity and quality. From a quantity perspective, we would want to site water supply wells in highly permeable material. We'd want the wells in the sands and gravels. And yet, these are also the places where the contaminant plumes are going to be traveling. So we need to be careful on where, where the wells are sited relative to these plumes. Similarly, along the coast, we can consider saltwater intrusion as another form of contaminant. And so in areas where there are large deposits of sands and gravels, we would expect those to be at higher risk for saltwater intrusion, where the intrusion might occur either from excessive pumping of water supply, fresh water on land, or perhaps even seawater, sea level rise. Um, as I showed, uh, the, in the glacial history, from the glacial history perspective, we were looking at large-scale features. We zoomed in on, at the MMR. There were clearly some places where there's some smaller-scale heterogeneities that we haven't accounted for in our large-scale conceptual model. And so it would be nice to actually go in and refine some of the conceptual model in the Western Cape. And uh, a gentleman from the Air Force Center for Environmental Excellence, which is the group running the cleanup program at the base, has, has nicely offered to uh, provide access to their data to me. And so hopefully I can uh, follow up on some of this in the future. So I'd be happy to answer any of your questions, and thanks for listening. I think they're surface expressions of shallower valleys. And actually, that's some work that Al Yuchuki did probably, I don't know, six or seven years ago. And there, um, his thought is that actually north of the Sandwich Moraine, when the ice retreated, the Sandwich Moraine and the Outwash Plains formed a dam to a lake that, that uh, occurred in Cape Cod Bay. So Cape Cod Bay used to be a freshwater lake. And uh, Al's theory is that that, sap, that uh, groundwater sapping, that, or that lake elevated groundwater levels on Cape Cod, and that sapping from the groundwater eventually etched out those, those valleys. And that so those. The Cape Cod Bay Lake is more recent. I'm confused as to whether that's younger or older. <laughs> it occurred after the after Cape Cod Bay or after uh, Lake Wapanoag. Uh, Excuse me. How much ice static rebound? I don't know. Does anyone else know? Very little. Very little. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know that. Yes. Sure. Sure. Um, what would be the easiest way to show this? Can everyone see this okay? <laughs> 
All right, the, the question is about the Kettle Lakes. <coughs> these lakes, all these lakes on Cape Cod are Kettle Lakes. And they formed because um, when the ice was retreating, ice blocks were left behind. Okay, then those ice blocks were subsequently buried by the outwash deposits. I th those ice blocks were probably there, well, they, the, the ice blocks were there when the lake was in existence. And in fact, there's very little silt deposit right around these two lakes, the Schumann and Johns Ponds. So there's actually, uh, you know, we've smoothed out this surface in here, but presumably those ice blocks affected the hydrology in the lake right there and prevented, well, first of all, by their mere presence, there was no sedimentation where the ice blocks were but also they probably affected the sedimentation right around the ice blocks. So anyways, those ice blocks were there. They got buried by the lake, by the outwash plains. We haven't seen evidence that the lake deposits actually covered them. Um, but then over time, those ice blocks melted. When they melted, the sediment above them slumped and formed these depressions. And these depressions now are filled with water. OK? No, OK. Uh, right. The, the glacial lake, OK, the lake was dammed, probably dammed to the south by ice contact deposits. So the lake started forming as soon as the ice started retreating. But and, and the lake expanded along with the retreat of the ice. But as the ice retreated, it also left, left big blocks of ice. So the ice blocks getting left behind and the lake were really at the same time. And then the ice blocks were left in the lake. The lake drained. The outwash deposits, uh, the outwash plains were deposited covered those ice blocks, the blocks melted, the sediments collapsed. Ice blocks were flowing in the lake? Um, these were really big. <laughs> hmm? Yeah. Yes. Do you have any idea about how, how deep the lake may have been? We don't. We, I don't think we have enough data to estimate that. on the order of 30 meters. How are you distributing this information to water districts and other people who may have tried to take the use of their work? Well, um, that three-dimensional model we just finished about two weeks ago. So this is all very new. Um, I have met with folks at MMR. I met with them last week, discussed this with them. And that's when uh, uh, Spence Smith offered to provide access to me to their database. Um, I think, uh, you know, in terms of refining the conceptual model, I think that the conceptual model in, West, in the Western Cape needs to be refined because, again, there are issues of scaling here. Um, you know, this, this payload channel was done on a large scale, uh, but there are a lot of heterogeneities at the smaller scale. And so we need to understand what the distribution of those are and how those relate to, to these lake sediments. Because I know, for one, when I was speaking with uh, the folks at MMR last week, um, they, they agree that there's some kind of a fine-grained high in here. They 
doubt that there's one down here. They think that the surface is probably much lower than I've shown it. Um, but, you know, we've, we've only reviewed, I think, 44 of the logs from NMMR, and they've drilled hundreds and hundreds of holes. So there's a lot of small-scale things going on that we just haven't accounted for here. Yeah, it is, but this is also a very large area, so even geophysics would be relatively difficult. Uh, although last week the guy at MMR just, just kind of piqued his interest, and he was wondering if they could do a big geophysical survey on the base. Uh, that's a good idea. Um, hopefully we can try to pursue some funding for something like that. <laughs> what do you mean by shallower with time? Um, well, the, the, the channels were carved out on the order of, I don't know, 17 or 18,000 years ago, and then were filled in. So at the moment, there's nothing happening to them. Uh, you know, the glaciers are long gone. Um, you know, there's certainly some processes going on at the surface, but the surface, the ground surface is, you know, 100 feet above sea level, so 30 meters. So these are, you know, maybe 50, there's maybe 50 meters of sands and gravels on top of these channels. So they're not, they're not changing through time. No. Yeah, John. Are there any natural chemical choices that could be used for the plumes that have been coming in? Probably, but um, offhand. Well, tritium, for example, is one used to do some age dating, and in fact, the USGS has done some of that. I don't think they encountered that problem. I think the problem, biggest problem they had was around the lakes where, where you get a mixture of precipitation and, and recent tritium values and groundwater flowing in and the older tritium values. As far as I know, I know the well at our house is very shallow. Um. <laughs> well, basically, the only people that are really having the kind of problems are the ones that are in the close south. Yeah, if, if there are wells. Do they all have deep wells? I don't know the, what the distribution of wells, the vertical distribution of wells is. So it's quite possible that wells aren't this deep. Um, my I better not, better not say that. Um, I think for the most. What? Well, that, that has to do with the recharge conditions. Um, so if we go back to that, kind of this uh, basic hydrology in water cycle overhead. So it's kind of an issue of where 
where the plume started relative to the infiltration, to the recharge, and where the water's discharging. So it's kind of, uh, and then of course the sedimentary um, deposits. So unfortunately for the MMR, they're located in the recharge zone. So they're actually located at the groundwater mound and so there's fairly significant vertical gradients and so a lot of these plumes are at depth. Farther along, you know, the, the water doesn't, doesn't travel as far vertically as we get closer and closer to the discharge point. I think it's more related to where it's located relative to the ocean boundaries. So we've got ocean on three sides, and the water then flows radially out towards the oceans in three directions. Right. Uh, when you, I did a survey of a lot of um, public meetings that the MMR has conducted, and in general, they say the plumes are traveling one to two feet per day, which is probably pretty close to what the groundwater's traveling at. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, the plumes are a good way to trace how fast the groundwater is. Right. Uh, they might be traveling slightly slower than groundwater because there are some processes that would retard plume transport. So for example, some of them on the leading edge or in the low concentration areas, there might be some microorganisms that are eating the contaminants so that the plume doesn't look like it travels quite as fast as it probably, maybe probably is. Not fast enough compared to the rate that the groundwater is moving. Um, yeah, I mean. Then you don't worry about it because it's not moving. Right. right. Well, that's, in a lot of places, that actually occurs. And that's, that's called monitored natural attenuation, or that's a process in monitored natural attenuation. Uh, and it does occur. There are also other processes. You know, these compounds can absorb onto fine particles. And so there might be some sorption, desorption going on so that the plume actually appears to be traveling faster, or slower, excuse me, than the groundwater. Uh, but let's see. The, the survey when they did their tritium sampling, I believe, I believe concluded that the water was traveling at about one to two feet per day. So I, th I think the values were consistent. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much.